Are there any questions before I get going? All right, well, let me remind you where we left off last time. Uh, so we have the definitions here. So if we have uh, some representation, uh, then, um, uh, then we get, there we go. Uh, so then we can consider this gradient operator, which I defined here. And, uh, and we compute the adjoint of this gradient and we get the divergence operator, which I've defined here. And we can therefore define the Laplacian as the divergence of the gradients and you can compute it explicitly as I've done here. So it's just uh, you apply twice the identity minus twice and then you average over uh, the translations uh, of this vector by the elements of your generating set. So this was for a finitely generated group. Right? We fixed a generating set. And then uh, the remark was, well, of course, this Laplacian is a positive operator, being any operator adjoint times itself. And, uh, and that uh, so its spectrum is therefore contained in the positive real line. And the theorem is that gamma has, has property T if and only if there's this spectral gap. So this is what we can prove now. Actually, this is a pretty easy theorem. It's really just a restatement of what it means to have almost invariant vectors. Uh, because you notice here, so here's the proof of this. And the thing to notice uh, is that the kernel of this Laplacian, uh, what is this? Well, this certainly contains the space subspace of invariant vectors here, because if you plug in an invariant vector, then you see you just get C minus C, which is zero. Uh, but actually, it's equal to the space of invariant vectors. Uh, but in fact, the kernel of this operator is equal to the space of invariant vectors. And why is that? This is since if you have some convex combination of vectors and they have the same norm in a Hilbert space, and if, they, if a convex combination equals a vector with the same norm, then that implies that all of those convex, com all of the terms of the convex combination had to be equal to the same vector themselves. So this, well, the, the, so this defines the kernel, and this implies that actually pi s C is equal to C for all S and S. Right, and this is uh, by convexity of the Hilbert space, convexity, I guess strict convexity of Hilbert space. Um, uh, if you haven't seen this before, maybe let me give you a quick proof or an outline of a proof. So uh, note, that if you have some alpha and beta greater than or equal to zero and alpha plus beta is equal to one, uh, and if you have some linear combination and if, well, so then, so then you have that alpha C plus beta eta squared uh, so this is equal to, we just expand it out, and so this is alpha squared norm of C plus um, twice the real part of, well, we have an alpha beta, twice alpha beta, and now we have the real part of C and eta, and then we have plus beta squared, and then the norm of eta squared, uh, so this, and this is equal to um, alpha C squared plus two alpha beta C eta plus beta squared eta. And this is equal to 
uh, I guess alpha norms C plus beta norms C squared. And so you have that the left hand side is equal to the right hand side. So of course these are canonical and it's only the one in the middle uh, where I used anything. And that's if and only if this middle term is equal to this middle term here, which is if and only if uh, these two vectors are parallel, one's a positive scalar multiple of the other. So this, this inequality, uh, this, then this inequality holds if and only if um, C is equal to some lambda eta or lambda greater than zero, right? Because the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, you get equality and the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, if and only if one is a, um, if and only if the vectors are parallel. Uh, so what does that mean? That means that if you take a convex combination of vectors and you get the, the norm of this convex combination, if they, that's the corresponding convex combination of the norms, then that's if and only if the vectors are parallel. And here's the proof for two vectors, but of course you can just use induction to get this for finally many vectors. So this means that if the left-hand side here equals the right-hand side, well, the left-hand side is a convex combination of univectors. The right-hand side is a univector. So therefore, the only way you could have equality is if you actually had equality of all the individual vectors. So that's strict convexity of the Hilbert space. Uh, so that shows that, in fact, the kernel of this operator equals the uh, space of invariant vectors. But actually, this works not just for the kernel, but for the approximate kernel as well. You can also say, uh, similarly, uh, that this operator delta S uh, has an approximate kernel. Uh, if and only if. Uh, the representation pi has almost invariant vectors. By that, what I mean is that if you have a sequence of unit vectors Cn, which asymptotically uh, like that, because here we have this quantitative estimate that is just Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. So therefore you get approximate equality if and only if you have approximate parallel, uh, the parallel property. So that you get an approximate kernel if and only if you have vectors that are almost invariant under this generating set and hence they're almost invariant under the group because you can take all words in the generating set. Uh, so and having an approximate kernel is exactly saying that if you look at the orthogonal complement of the kernel, then you have uh, zero in the spectrum there. But of course, zero can't be isolated in the spectrum there because if you have a, a, an isolated point in the spectrum, it has to be an eigen, eigenvector, right? an eigenvalue. So when you restrict yourself to the orthogonal complement of the invariant vectors, if zero is, is in the spectrum, then it has to be not an isolated point. Right, so you get C, therefore, if and only if this happens, which is if and only if uh, we do not have spectral gap. All right, so that's the spectral gap characterization of uh, property T, um, which like I said, is really just a reformulation. Uh, nothing so sophisticated going on here. Uh, but one thing I do want to talk about is how we can use this in relation to co-cycles and how this relates to certain co-cycles. So let me now talk about co-cycles a little bit more. So recall, that if pi is a representation of the group, so a co-cycle or a one co-cycle uh, is a map C from your group 
to the Hilbert space H such that it satisfies this co-cycle relation that the co-cycle of a product is the co-cycle of S plus pi of S and then the co-cycle at T. So that's the co-cycle relation. And then there are natural uh, co-cycles. So we, so we let Z1 of gamma with respect to pi uh, be the space of co-cycles. So clearly this is a vector space. Uh, we have a vector subspace. So a co-cycle is inner. Uh, a co-cycle is inner if co-cycle C is inner if there exists some vector C in H such that C of T is equal to C minus pi T C. Uh, so definitely such a map, a map of this form is a co-cycle. You can sit down and check that very easily. And these will be the inner co-cycles and we let, we let B1 of gamma pi uh, be the space of inner co-cycles. Uh, so this is a vector subspace, and then we can let the first cohomology group, H1 of gamma pi is the uh, quotient. So the cocycles by the co-boundaries. Uh, and one thing we can prove with property T, so this is a theorem due to Delorme and Guy uh, I'll write down here since we've already proved it basically, is that a gamma has property T if and only if H1 of gamma is trivial for all representations, for all unitary representations. And we can give a proof of this, a proof of this, just uh, we've already done this. We've showed that property T is equivalent to every co-cycle being bounded. And so to prove this, all we have to prove is this lemma, which is that a co-cycle is bounded, a co-cycle is bounded, if and only if it is inner. All right, and then we have this Delorme Guichardet. Yeah. All right, so let's go ahead and prove this. Uh, so one direction is obvious is that the inner cocycles are bounded. This is obvious. So we just need to prove the other direction. Uh, and for this, uh, we're going to use um, another convexity type property of Hilbert spaces, uh, which is that any bounded set has a unique Chebyshev center. So let me define what that means. So let's go ahead and set the set X equal to the range of this cocycle. Uh, and note that this is a bounded set. And we want to prove that uh, this set is inner. And so what do we do? We let say C naught be the Chebyshev center of X. And if you've never seen the Chebyshev center before, I'll explain this in a moment and we'll prove that it exists. Uh, so what does this mean? So this means IE C naught is the unique element minimizing or realizing the infimum of the function that takes uh, C 
and sends it to the soup over eta in our set x of uh, c minus eta. Right, so this is uh, some function on our Hilbert space H. Uh, it is, takes values in the positive reals, and since this is a bounded set, it is indeed a positive real. And, uh, and so there is, you know, an infimum. Um, uh, as you, as C tends to infinity, of course, this soup will get uh, large as you go to infinity. So, um, and this is a continuous function, so it's gonna have, have an infimum. And the, there's a theorem which says that it, it attains its minimum. There's a vector which, which attains this minimum, and it's, this vector is unique. So, and that's called the Chebyshev center of the set. Uh, after the proof, I'll prove to you that it exists. Uh, so then, what can we do is that we just note that since CST is equal to CS plus pi S CT, we have the therefore if we take the Chebyshev center of this set, that gives us C naught. If we take the, um, uh, uh, hold on. If we take the, uh, wait, something's, yeah, that's, that's fine. This is for each S, so we'll fix S. That's fine. And if we take the Chebyshev center of this set as we vary T, well then by a change of variables, we just get C naught. And here we have C of S. And now here we have the Chebyshev center of this is C, and then we just, uh, again, we have an isometric representation. So we just map to pi of S C naught. All right, so therefore this happens and this is for all S and gamma fixed. And now just rewriting it, we see that therefore the cocycle S is nothing but the, this minus by S, C naught. So we see that not only is it inner, but we even have this method of finding this inner vector. We can do this in an efficient manner by finding the Chebyshev center of this, uh, of the orbit. Uh, so that proves the lemma modulo this proof that I told you I would do of the existence and uniqueness of the Chebyshev center. So this is again another convexity type property in Hilbert space, although maybe this one isn't quite as well known as the other one I said. Uh, so let me go ahead and prove that. So uh, this is another lemma, call it, and that is so H a Hilbert space. X and H bounded. So then there exists a unique vector C naught in H. It may or may not live in X, usually it won't, uh, such that uh, this vector, this minimizes or realizes the infimum is the infimum of the function that takes C and sends it to the soup over eta and X of C minus eta. All right, so this is what we'll prove. And this is a fun, uh, a fun proof. Uh, so we'll, what we'll do is we'll set D to be this infimum. So let D so this is gonna be, I guess, greater than or equal to zero. And we're gonna let D denote the infimum. I guess I should have said X is non-empty. Um, let D denote the infimum. And, uh, and then we'll just choose a sequence of vectors which get closer and close to the infimum. So then we choose some Cn and H such that uh, if we define Dn to be this supremum, so such that Dn 
which is the soup over eta and x of Cn minus eta. Uh, so that this converges to D. All right, so we just find better and better approximations of this, of this thing. And then uh, here's the trick, is the trick is to use the parallelogram identity. Um, and what we can do there is just, so then we have that Cn plus Cm over two minus eta squared. So by the parallelogram identity, this is one half Cn minus eta squared plus one half Cm minus eta squared and then minus Cn minus Cm uh, over two. All right, because we have uh, this vector and this vector. And so the parallelogram identity says that one half this vector squared plus one half this vector squared is their sum squared plus their difference, the norm of their difference squared. So this is the parallelogram, or not the one half, the one half you can put inside. So, uh, oh, there should be a square here. And yes, I believe that's the parallelogram identity. Okay, so then what can we do with the parallelogram identity? Well, the thing to notice is that now if we take the supremum over all eta, so taking sup uh, over eta and x, uh, what do we get here? Well, on one hand, we have some vector minus the sup. Uh, so we know that the left-hand side is um, uh, is greater than or equal to d. So we have d squared, which is defined to be the n-femum. So this is greater than or equal to the soup of this thing. But now this, of course, is equal to the right-hand side. And when we take the soup of the right-hand side, uh, what, what are we going to get? We're going to get one-half dn uh, squared plus one half dm squared minus cn minus cm over two squared. And we know that this as n and m converge to infinity as n and m tend to infinity, this converges to uh, one half d plus one half d. So that's d minus, well, whatever. So it's, well, it converges to D plus the super limb soup of this. So what do we get? We get that in particular, sorry about that. Uh, if you now move this to the other side, we get that therefore Cn minus Cm over two squared, that this is equal to D minus Dn. That's what I meant to write. This is one half dn squared uh, plus one half dm squared minus d squared and this as n and m goes to infinity tends to zero. So what does that mean? That means that this sequence is a Cauchy sequence and hence converge, converges. So therefore cn is Cauchy and so converges to some C naught, which then realizes the infimum. So that shows existence, uh, but at the same time, this also so shows uniqueness. Can everybody see that? So this shows uniqueness because I took an arbitrary sequence, which approximated the, the and phenom. So this means that if you had two elements which gave you the unique and phenom, then you could take the sequence which alternates between those two vectors. But then we just showed that that's a Cauchy sequence. 
So those two vectors had to be the same. All right, should we show that an arbitrary sequence which approximates the infimum is Cauchy? So therefore, there can only be one limit. Uh, so this shows existence. Geometrically, this point lies in the center of the set, right? <laughs> Uh, I mean, this is the definition of the center, I guess. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, it doesn't, it may live, it probably lives outside the set. Of course, if you have, if you have two points, then it's just the midpoint, uh, which is outside of those two points. Um, yeah. This shows existence, but also uniqueness. But that is certainly a nice property of Hilbert spaces that you have is, is you have any bounded set has this unique Chebyshev center. Uh, so that's a useful property of Hilbert spaces to keep in mind. Um, it's uh, especially useful if you have isometric actions and you want to find fixed points, something like this, because if you have a bounded orbit, then automatically you get that uh, your group action fixes the Chebyshev center, and so uh, you know you get a fixed point. All right. Uh, so yeah, these two previous lemmas then complete the proof of the delorme guichardet theorem, uh, which says that you have property if and only if your cohomology groups also always vanish. Now it turns out that the a little bit nicer fact about cohomology groups is that not only are they vector spaces, so the group of the space of cocycles and so the space of intercocycles, but they also have a natural topology, which is the topology of pointwise convergence. So on the space of cocycles, we consider the topology of pointwise convergence. Uh, so IE, IE some sequence of cocycles uh, converge to a cocycle if and only if CI of T converges to C of T in the Hilbert space uh, norm for all T and gamma. So this is a natural topological space you can consider here. Uh, and with this topology, the space of inner cocycles is not necessarily closed in general. And so another natural space to consider is the reduced cohomology. So we, um, we let H1 bar of gamma with respect to pi denote the space of cocycles. Uh, gamma modulo the closure of the space of inner cocycles. And so then, uh, so the reduced cohomology groups are a little bit nicer because, for instance, you can show that they decompose under direct integral decomposition. They have a natural decomposition there and some other various features. So these are nicer spaces to consider. Uh, unfortunately, if you look through the proof that we gave of the delorme guichardet theorem, um, so if we don't have property T, how do we produce a cocycle? And if you go back to how we did it, we did this somewhere a, couple, a lecture or two ago. Uh, let's see, I can have it uh, somewhere around here. Uh, was this theorem? I already passed it up. It's uh, this. Uh, yeah, this argument right here that we gave. Uh, so the idea was is that we took these cosine. Here was our cocycle that we defined right here. So here's our non-inner cocycle. It was this unbounded thing. But if you realize how we did this, uh, we explicitly defined it as a limit of inner cocycles. And it's just the, the limit of these vectors, you could take finite direct sums of the CNs, and these are inner, these vectors then give you inner cocycles, and we explicitly defined C of T as a limit of these cocycles. So in the Delorme Guichardet theorem, we actually explicitly construct these cocycles as 
in the closure of the inner cocycles. So if we want to construct a non, uh, if we want to construct non-trivial cocycles and reduce cohomology, we need a new trick. And, uh, and so we can do that, and that's what we'll do now. And the new trick is to notice uh, back here when I gave this argument about the spectral gap that um, I mentioned here that if you don't have spectral gap, then you have an approximate kernel and hence you have almost invariant vectors. But you actually have something that's a little bit better than an approximate kernel and that's the following. So note that if gamma is finitely generated by S, S finite uh, symmetric, uh, so then if this Laplacian operator does, and remember the Laplacian operator was defined as the divergence of the gradient, uh, if this does not have spectral gap, so then what can we do? Then uh, take Cn, say, in the spectrum, such that Cn converges to zero, since it doesn't have spectral gap, such a sequence exists. And what do we know? We know that anything in the spectrum, this is a, a self-adjoint operator. So we know from the spectral theorem that anything in the spectrum is an approximate eigenvalue. So we know that then there exists uh, unit vectors, Cn, such that uh, this Laplacian applied to Cn is very, very close to Cn times Cn. Uh, and this is a fact I want to maybe star because I want to use this fact and this is the crucial fact that will allow us to construct uh, non-trivial reduced homology. So we'll, we'll be able to um, really hone this, uh, this proof of delorme guichardet all right, so this is a fact I want to remember, and we're going to use this in a little bit. Uh, but in order to do that, I also want to pass to a limit of Hilbert spaces. So I want to pass to a limit of representations. So I need to discuss limits of representations. And a convenient way to discuss limits of representation is to use uh, ultra filters. And um, Maybe some people in this audience have seen ultra filters before and are comfortable with them, but maybe some others are not. So I thought I would just quickly go over uh, ultra filters on, uh, on the natural numbers. So, and, and give the basic properties that, are, that I'm gonna use from them. Uh, so what are ultra filters on the natural numbers? So there are many ways to define them. Uh, coming from operator algebras, uh, I have a, my preferred way of defining them, and that's as follows. So an ultra filter on N or any topological, any topological space, compact Hausdorff or locally compact Hausdorff space, or any Polish space even, an ultra filter on N is a point. Uh, omega, which is in the stone check compactification of N. Now the stone check compactification, uh, remember that this is um, the space of homomorphisms from L infinity of N to the complex numbers. So unital star homomorphisms. Uh, and it has the universal property so that L infinity of n, it's the so this is the Galpin spectrum of L infinity of n. So you have a canonical isomorphism between L infinity of n and continuous functions on the stone check compactification. So if you like, uh, you can think of this. This is how I like to think about ultra filters: is it's just point some point in the spectrum of this space of continuous functions here. 
so what does that mean? That means whenever you have a continuous function on the natural numbers, so the natural numbers are discrete, that means any bounded function, a continuous bounded function, uh, then you have a continuous extension to this compact Hausdorff space, and so then you can evaluate it at this ultra field. Right, so what does this, what does this mean? Uh, so note that if K is compact Hausdorff, and A maps the natural numbers to K is continuous. Of course, the natural numbers is discrete, so this just means any set, any function from the natural numbers to K. Uh, so then, by the universal property of the stone check compactification, uh, there exists a unique continuous extension A tilde mapping the stone check compactification to K. That's the universal property of the stone check compactification. Uh, but therefore, what can we do? Well, now we have a function, a continuous function from the stone check compactification in the K, so we can just evaluate it on our point omega. So we, we define the limit as n tends to omega of this sequence a n as equal to just a tilde evaluated at this point omega. So whenever we have a function from the natural numbers to a compact Hausdorff space, we have this limit along the ultra filter. Uh, of course, uh, it could be silly. So for instance, if we just evaluated, uh, we could this ultra filter itself could just be evaluation at the number five. And this would not be a particularly nice ultra filter. So we'll say that uh, omega is free if it is not in the natural number. So if it's not just point evaluation as some element of the sequence, then it's called a free ultra filter. All right, so what are various properties that this has? Well, one thing is, is that uh, each point in N is an isolated point in the stone check compactification. And so this means that if you change the function on finitely many points, uh, then this doesn't change the limit. So if you change a sequence by finitely many points, it doesn't change the limit, which means that this only depends on the tail of the sequence. So some properties. Uh, so one is that if uh, the limit as n tends to infinity of a n exists, so then this is equal to the usual limit. All right, so the limit along the ultra filter uh, is just equal to the usual limit if the limit exists. So this, but the advantage of the ultra filter is that the limit along the ultra filter always exists. Indeed, we, how we define it, it always exists. So it's, it's some way to take, generalize this notion of limit so that it always exists, as long as the function maps into a compact space. Um, uh, so that's one nice property. And then, of course, it's also linear and multiplicative. So two is that this map lim uh, is, well, if the range, so this is for any compact Hausdorff space, but uh, if we have A is in L infinity of the natural numbers, uh, so that means that its range is a compact subset of the, or is pre-compact in the com complex numbers. So we can take as limits. And if you have two of them, A, B here, so then the limb as n tends to omega of A, N plus B, N is equal to the sum. So it's a linear. Uh, same with scalar multiplication and also multiplicative. Um,
All right, so these are again usual properties of limits that you have. Uh, the one, one property that it doesn't uh, have so nicely is uh, if you pass to subsequences, you may get a different, uh, a different limit. And that's just something you have to live with. So don't pass the subsequences if you're using ultra filters. Uh, and D, that kind of has to be the case because, for instance, if you take the sequence 10101010, uh, then it has a perfectly nice limit along the ultra filter, but you can take two different subsequences and you'll get two different limits. So, yeah. okay. Uh, so that's, that's ultra filters. So they're extremely useful in operator algebras. They're also extremely useful in logic and logicians hate the fact that operator algebraists use the letter omega. Uh, so operator algebraists tend to like the letter omega um, but logicians hate this because, of course, omega is, is an ordinal, not, not an ultrafilter. Uh, but operator algebraists actually introduced ultrafilters first. So this goes back to the work of uh, Dixmier. And, uh, and so I feel like we're okay using our own terminology since we introduced them first. So we introduced them maybe four or five years before the logicians did. Okay, so uh, they're extremely useful in sort of analytic constructions. Uh, they give you a convenient way to use compactness, uh, basically. And one construction that we'll use is we will use uh, this construction of the Hilbert spaces. So here's a basic example. So suppose Hn are Hilbert spaces. and omega a free ultra filter. Uh, so then what can we do? Well, well we let uh, consider this space L infinity of the natural numbers uh, with values in Hn. So what is this? This is the set of all functions. Uh, let me use Greek letters since I tend to like that for Hilbert spaces. So these are functions from the natural numbers to the union of the Hn's such that Cn belongs to Hn for each n and they're uniformly bounded. So the soup over all n of Cn is bounded. Now this is a perfectly nice Banach space. So this is a Banach space. So that's a perfectly nice Banach space. Um, so far, we haven't used the ultra filter at all. And what we'll use the ultra filter for is it'll allow us to define a, an inner product on this Banach space or a sesquilinear form. So if C and eta are two vectors in this set here, it's a Banach space with the soup norm. Um, that's what the norm we're considering. Uh, so if we have two vectors in here, so we define their inner product with respect to the ultra filter as the limit, as n tends to omega, of the inner products individually. All right, so notice that since these two vectors are bounded in this norm, by Cauchy-Schwartz, the space of inner products and absolute value will be bounded. So this does map into a pre-compact subset of the complex numbers. So we can define, so the limit exists. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you can check uh, quite easily that this is a non-negative definite uh, sesquilinear form. So this is, this is a non-negative definite sesquilinear form. But it may have a kernel. Um, and so if we want to get a Hilbert space, we need to mod out by the kernel. So we have that the kernel of this, so this is the set of all C in this space, L infinity of natural numbers, uh, 
h n such that the limit as n tends to omega of the norms of these is equal to zero. So that's the kernel of this. And one thing which is a pretty easy exercise to check is that this is a closed subspace. So this is a closed subspace of natural numbers of this space that I defined. So that's a pretty easy exercise. I'll leave it to you guys to check that this is indeed a closed subspace. So what this means is this means that if we define, so we define the ultra product of the Hilbert spaces of Hn, this is by definition going to be uh, this space here modulo the kernel of this sesquilinear form. And since the kernel is closed, this will be a Banach space, but it has this inner product giving the norm, so it's therefore an inner product space which is complete and hence it's a Hilbert space. Uh, so this is a Hilbert space. And this Hilbert space is useful because it allows you to take approximate properties and uh, approximate inequalities, say, and turn them into genuine equalities. Uh, so it's, like I said, ultra, ultra products or ultra powers are usually convenient ways of using compactness argu arguments. So that's what we're gonna do here. So notice also, if we have representations, if we have representations by n mapping gamma to the unitary group of hn. So then we get a representation pi omega mapping gamma to the unitary group of this large Hilbert space. And this is by pi omega t applied to some vector c n. So any, any vector in here has some representation of c n's, and you just define this to be uh, pi n of t c n. You define it to be this new sequence. And then you have to check that this uh, preserves the kernel. Well, I mean, you check pretty easily that this preserves the inner product, and hence is a unitary representation. And that's that's a simple check. All right, so uh, uh, so if we have a sequence of representations, then we get this new ultra limit representation. So this is nice. All right, so now uh, we can actually uh, prove something about reduced cohomology. Uh, so let's talk about reduced cohomology. So now again, gamma is a finitely generated group with symmetric. One question. Yeah. If you take all of the H hands to be the same, H is naturally embedded in sure. the ultra and then the product, right? Yeah, if you take all the H hands to be the same, then you have that the H is diagonally embedded and hence is a sub-representation. Yeah. yeah, of course, this, uh, as you can see, we took L infinity. L infinity is, is a non-separable space. So this will typically give you, even if you start with separable, Hilbert spaces, this will typically give you a non-separable Hilbert space. Um, yeah, so the, this is a, you know, some sort of monstrous space. It's hard to maybe picture what this actually gives you, but it does give you a Hilbert space with a representation, um, which, is, which is important. Yeah. All right, so let's take gamma finally generated group with symmetric generating set S. And we want to investigate uh, uh, reduced cohomology. And uh, the advantage of having a finitely generated set is that this topology of pointwise convergence, we can uh, de determine that directly on the generators. So note that if CI are cocycles, of gamma with respect to some representation pi. 
So then CI converge to C if and only if CI of S converges to C of S uh, for S and S. Why is that? That's because if you know it converges on certain letters, then it converges, uh, the co-cycle identity tells you that it converges on words of those letters. Right? So it's enough just to take any generating set and get convergence on that. Well, the nice thing about this is that now we can actually put, uh, so this topology on the space of co-cycles, we can embed this in a Hilbert space. So uh, we consider, so, we consider the embedding of Z1 gamma phi into, it's just going to be a direct sum of H S times by just a co-cycle, a co-cycle just gets sent to this direct sum over S and S of the cocycle uh, S. And then we see that this map gives a homeomorphism of Z1 onto its image here. Uh, moreover, we see that the image is, is closed. So this identifies uh, the space of cocycles with a closed subspace of a Hilbert space. So therefore, Z1, you know, pi, is a closed subspace of this Hilbert space. And this is useful for us because we have the space of inner cocycles, which is inside of there, not necessarily closed. And we want to know if there is a cocycle which is not in the closure of the space of inner cocycles. Well, since we're in a Hilbert space, uh, that's the same as saying that there's a cocycle which is orthogonal to the space of inner cocycles, co right? So we see that therefore that the reduced cohomology of gamma and pi is non-trivial if and only if there exists some cocycle C such that C, uh, some cocycle C, which is not the zero cocycle, such that C is orthogonal to the space of inner cocycles with respect to this inner product. All right, so now we should check what exactly is this inner product on the space of inner cocycles. So, i.e., i.e. we want that the inner for all C and H, we have zero is equal to the inner product of this C with this cocycle, which is given by pi dot C in this, in this uh, space. But now we write out what that is. Well, that just means the sum here, and now we have the cocycle evaluated at S, so this is sum for S and S. And now we have here C minus pi S C. And now what we can do is we can use the fact that this is a unitary representation, move the S to the other side. So this is a sum for S and S. And now we have the cocycle at S, and then minus pi of S inverse cocycle at S respect to C. The advantage of this is now we can move the sum inside and also we can use the cosec relation to note that this right here uh, by the cosec relation is just C of S inverse. So we have two negatives that gives us positive and also we have a symmetric set here in S. So summing over this inverses is the same as summing over the set S. And so we get that this is equal to twice the sum over S and S of the cocycle of S with respect to this vector D. Let's see. All right, so we see that a cocycle being orthogonal to the inner cocycles actually has a very nice description because if their inner product is zero for every vector, that's if and only if this vector here is zero. So we say that a cocycle is harmonic
if or maybe s harmonic if you want to be explicit here because we fixed a generating set s harmonic if when you sum over the generators of the co-cycle you get zero and we just showed that being harmonic is equivalent to being orthogonal to the space of inner co-cycles so therefore we can see that uh, so therefore the conclusion the upshot is that h1 the reduced cohomology of gamma with respect to pi this is non-zero if and only if there exists a non-zero harmonic co-cycle so that's that's what we've established so far now let me go back to this uh, theorem we did before this star property that I gave you before right so let me even just to make life easier I'll just copy and paste this this is something you can do on the computer that you can't really do on the board maybe the one advantage uh, so if we don't have property T we don't have spectral gap and the Laplacian, then there exists these vectors Cn, which have which are almost eigenvalues. So what can we do from this? So if, well, I'll just continue on in this argument. So let's go ahead and set eta to be about one over square root of Cn Cn. Now a so this is eta n. Now, a to n may be very large, but what we compute is, so then, what is the gradient of these a to n's? Well, notice what is the gradient. The gradient is exactly the direct sum, I guess, one over s square root. Uh, and now we have a to minus um, pi s a to. So this is exactly our co-cycle, our inner co-cycle, which we realize uh, in this way. So this is a co-cycle uh, embedded into the silver space. And let's go ahead and compute the norm of this. We'll compute the norm squared. So this is the inner product of the gradient eta with the gradient eta, which again, this is now the Laplacian eta with eta and uh, here we can plug in what eta is so this is one over cn and now we have the laplacian cn oh there should be an n everywhere apologies so with cn but now the laplacian this was chosen cn was chosen so that this is an approximate eigenvector and our approximation can be as close as we want. So we can choose that this is as close as we want to actually plugging in Cn, so that would give us just the norm of Cn squared, which is one, these are univect, Cn were univectors. So by choosing our Cn, we can make this, uh, we can make this as close as we want to one, uh, but, what do we have? We have that if we look at the Laplacian of S, A to N, look at this square. Well, what is this? Well, this is now, uh, we do the same thing, but now we see we get, uh, um, uh, we're gonna get uh, A to N is, well, the Laplacian applied to A to N is approximately equal to Cn times it. So this is going to be square root of approximately square root of Cn. So this is gonna be Cn so this is approximately equal to Cn times the norm of Cn, which again are univectors, which is Cn, which goes to zero. So this is what we have here. Uh, so this having no spectral gap and then using the spectral theorem a little bit so that we can say we have these approximate eigenvectors, uh, that allows us to construct the sequence such that the gradient has norm ones, but the Laplacian converges to zero. So what can we do now? Now we can define uh, 
define CN mapping gamma to HN by CN of T is equal to eta N minus pi T eta N. So these are co-cycles. And what do we see? Well, we see that I already showed you that if we look at uh, the sum over S and S of CN of S, uh, and now we want to know the sum of CN of S squared, that this is exactly equal to the gradient of eta N squared, which is very, very close to one. So in particular, that means that these sequences, CN of S, are always bounded sequences because their sum squared is less than or equal to one. So each individual element has to be less than or equal to one. And again, from the co-cycle identity, we get that therefore, the soup, therefore for all T and gamma, the soup over N of the norms of CN of T is finite. Because we have it for the generating set, and hence by the closed cycle identity, you have it for any words in the generating set. It'll be at most the word length times, well, it'll be at most the word length, you know? So this specifically, the, the norm of CN of T uh, squared, or I guess without the squared, this is going to be less than or equal to the length of T with respect to this generating set S. And that's true for all N. Uh, but on the other hand, what do we know? We know that the Laplacian, well, let's go ahead and compute what is the sum over S and S of CN of S. So this is also a bounded sequence. And let's compute its sum here. And this is going to be, uh, I guess, sum S and S, uh, eta N, minus uh, pi uh, s eta n. Well, we recognize that. We can pull that out. So this is nothing but, I guess, maybe I should have divided by 1 over s here. And then we see that this is nothing but the Laplacian applied to eta n, which we know goes to 0. So what do we get? We can now pass everything to the ultra limit. So we then get define C omega mapping gamma to the ultra limit here. And this is by C omega of T is equal to CN T this. So this is well defined because we know that this is a bounded sequence. Uh, moreover, this will be a co-cycle because uh, at each step it was a co-cycle. So this is a co-cycle. And what else do we know? We know that the sum over uh, 1 over s times the sum of c omega of s, s and s, so this is um, the norm of this. The norm of this is nothing but the limit as n goes to omega of the norms of the corresponding sequence, which we just saw was zero because of this. My kids are coming in, they want to say hi. Um, on the other hand, if we look at, so this is a harmonic, so therefore C omega is harmonic. But on the other hand, if we look at the, put the sum on the outside, sum S and S of C omega S squared. Well, this is again, then the limit along the sequence, which we see is equal to one. So we get the therefore C omega is non-zero. All right, and sorry I've gone long today, but uh, I wanted to finish this argument. So the conclusion we get here is that if you don't have property T, 
and you don't have spectral gap, then you can construct this harmonic co-cycle, which is non-zero and hence is not approximately inner. So we get this uh, theorem here, which I think uh, is attributed, if you look in the literature, this is attributed to about eight different people. But the first place it was written explicitly is due to Shalom uh, in, uh, I want to say, the late 90s. Uh, so this is written explicitly written by Shalom in the late 90s, although it was maybe implicit in earlier work. And the theorem is, is that uh, if gamma is finally generated, so then uh, gamma has property T if and only if the reduced cohomology of gamma is zero for all representations. All right, so the delorme guichardet theorem said that this was true for the non-reduced cohomology, um, but it it's also true for the reduced cohomology if you restrict to finitely generated groups. Uh, and the proof we just gave is, is the proof because if you don't have property T, then we produced a non-trivial harmonic co-cycle. But conversely, if you have property T, then already the non-reduced cohomology groups vanish and hence so the cohomology groups themselves also vanish. Um, and then the last thing I'll remark is that finite generation is necessary here because of course, if you're just locally property T, then the same thing will happen. Um, so, so for instance, the infinite uh, symmetric group um, has trivial reduced cohomology for every representation, but it's certainly not property T if that's an infinite amenable group. So, um, so the finally generation is necessary in this, in this state. All right, are there any questions? Sorry for going a little long. Uh, are there any questions before I would end? Uh, yes, uh, could you please remind me of the definition of approximate kernel? Uh, approximate kernel just means that it's a kernel, but when you take a limit. So uh, an operator T, T has an approximate kernel. If there exists Cn in the Hilbert space H unit vectors such that um, T Cn converges to zero. And then the fact I'm using, so this is a fact I'll, I'll use without proof, it's just a consequence of the spectral theorem if you like, and that is that if uh, the kernel of, tree of T is zero, so then T, uh, so this is T symmetric, T self adjoint, or normal is fine, but if the kernel of T is zero, then T has an approximate kernel uh, if and only if um, uh, zeros in the spectrum of T, which is if and only if. Uh, zero is not an isolated point, is not isolated in the spectrum of T. Uh, yeah. So in general, if, if you have an, if for a self-adjoint operator, if you have an isolated point in the spectrum, then it will necessarily be uh, an eigenvalue. But here we say restricted to the orthogonal complement of the space of invariant vectors, then on that orthogonal complement, we have no kernel. And so we have these three equivalences. And this is a, uh, you can prove this pretty easily with the spectral theorem. So I, I won't go into further details here. Other questions? All right.